wanted to let you know that today's training will also be available on our website at impact100srq.org, uh, the recording as well as the slides. So first and foremost, we'd like to welcome you and also thank the Manatee Performing Arts Center for allowing us to be here in this beautiful auditorium. today would not be possible if it was not for Susie Bowie from the Manatee Community Foundation. <laughs> Susie is the first one to introduce us to Robin Halsey from Results First, who will be doing the second half of our training this morning. So Susie, would you like to say a few words? Hey everybody, how oh, nice to see everybody in person, all of your wonderful faces today. Um, I want to thank the wonderful team for Impact 100 at SRQ. They are incredible, incredible people. And I really want to thank you for all of your time. As you know, time is the one thing that you will never get back. So thank you so much for choosing to be here. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, I know that you've heard a million times, but you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, right? So why not, why not try and go for this? Um, I hear a lot of people saying, my gosh, that's a lot of work to maybe be one of the five organizations chosen, four, five, or six, whatever, but I spent a lot of time over the pandemic thinking. How many people have spent a lot of time over the pandemic thinking? <laughs> All right, thinking, thinking. Um, I've chosen to spend a lot of my time thinking about mindfulness, and mindfulness means that we're focused on the present moment. We're focused on getting everything we can out of the present moment whether it's the relationship we're in, the person we're talking to, doing the running man, something funny in front of an audience, we're focused on that actual present moment. So as you think about Impact 100 SRQ, as you think about all the opportunities you have, do focus on that prize, but also think about what happens as a result, right, of going through the process and being in the present moment. Are you building the strength of your team? Are you gaining new language to frame your results and gains for other donors and foundations and the community? Are you understanding an opportunity to better one of your programs and the results that they get, ultimately benefiting our community? One of the quotes I love from Toni Morrison is, as you enter positions of trust and power, dream a little before you think. So I think a lot of this is about dreaming, right? Dreaming big. While we set up the nexus at Manatee Community Foundation of what donors want for the community and what nonprofits know that they can deliver through working with their teams and through their clients, we believe in dreaming as well as thinking. So thanks for being with us today. Enjoy your time. Thank you, Susie. And dreaming big, that's what this workshop is all about, a big idea training, and it's our very first. We're so excited that you are here. So if we could, this is going to be an interactive workshop today. So by a show of hands, before you receive the invitation to attend today, how many of you were, have, were familiar with Impact 100 SRQ? Awesome, that's fantastic. And I'm curious, how many of you actually have applied for one of our grants in the past? Okay, that's great, wonderful. Um, curious, Michelle, you have the speaker over there, the, the microphone. So what prompted you, just a couple of you wouldn't mind sharing, what prompted you to be here this morning? We would love to hear from you. Anyone? Raise a hand. Oh, right up here in front, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. I know, we have to tell you, put your running shoes on. I'm Emily Lane from Manatee Habitat. Um, I've written this grant for two or three different organizations in the past, and it really is about a big idea. And dreaming and thinking of something you'd really like to do that would do so much for the community. And even if you don't get the grant, you move yourself down that road already. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Thank you for being here today. And we'd like to start a little bit differently. We're going to start with a video. And this video really resonates for me um, as I am the founding president of Impact 100 SRQ. So if you could play the clip. Oh, I did it. I'm not very good. 
very techy. Here we go. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling in his friends to join in. So he takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out, you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is of how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So here at Impact 100 SRQ, we are a grassroots organization. And I first learned of the Impact 100 model from my mom. My mom and sister made that life-changing phone call, and I was the lone nut. But I immediately began to share my contagious enthusiasm with anyone and everyone I came in contact with. My first followers were the two co-founders, Jody Zaraga and Tilly McFadden. And that is where our journey began and continues. We have momentum. Our model is simple. At least 100 women, we each contribute $1,000. And then 100% of our member donations fund grants to you, nonprofits that serve Sarasota and Manatee County. In just three years, I'm not used to flipping my own slides. In just three years, we have awarded nine, nine grants of $100,000 increments, meaning nearly $1 million to you, nonprofits that serve our community. That makes Impact 100 SRQ the fastest growing Impact 100 chapter in the world. that we have funded so far are making a difference every day in the community. Today I'd like to share with you about two of our recipients, one from our first year, Mothers Helping Mothers, and the grant awarded to them was given to um, $114,000 was matched to help them eliminate 
their biggest expense, their monthly rent. They immediately pivoted and used the savings to fund their programs and expand and help the neediest of the need in our community. And as a result, 22,000 children received services and programs because of the Impact 100 grant. That is transformational. Another uh, recipient that is completely different is Children's Cancer Center. Children's Cancer Center provides services locally here in Sarasota and Manatee County to families that have the unfortunate diagnosis of one of their children with cancer. The Impact 100 grant helped bring programs right here in Sarasota and Manatee County to those families. So they didn't have to make that track uh, back and forth to St. Pete and Tampa. More than 50 families will have been positively influenced and lifted up in one of their most desperate times because of an Impact 100 grant. So here at Impact 100, we have momentum. And we are a collective of giving women. We are creating awareness. We are educating our members. But we too, like you, reflect. And we assess if we are being mission focused. And are we able to deliver on our mission effectively and in the proper manner? So our mission is to empower women. And we want to effectively fund transformational grants for years to come. So we have to ask ourselves the hard question, just like you do. We ask ourselves, are our activities and our outcomes, are they in line with our mission? Are there opportunities for improvement? And are we execute, executing our mission in the fullest capacity? So to help us deal with these important questions, I'd like to introduce to you Betsy Friedman, our nonprofit director. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you all for being here. So, oops, we've got all this going for us, and yet, we still can find a big problem. We realize that we're only as transformational as the number of women we have, so the number of grants we can fund, and the kinds of applications we receive. So if you look at what we funded, it would be easy to think that we're all about capital projects, but we don't only want to build building, fund buildings. We, you know, not everybody needs a building. There are sometimes there are way more effective ways than creating a building to house a program in. So we do want to fund service-driven uh, programs. And so looking forward, we want to look at to what extent are our grants tr transforming the lives of the 41% of people living in Sarasota and Manatee counties who are asset-limited, income-constrained employed, or living in poverty. And we want to look at how is what we're funding contributing to improving and or preserving the relationships, the quality of life, the resources, the culture, and the habitability of this place we all call paradise. So we realized that we needed to communicate better with you. So who actually really knew about us and what we, we funded? Not everybody. And honestly, who's, who's a little uncertain about the kinds of grants that we fund and what we're looking for? Raise them high. <laughs> this is proof that we need to communicate better. Uh, we want to extend our reach into the nonprofit community, and thankfully, we went to Susie Bowie, very scared and timidly, and said, uh, we're not, we know we're not reaching in Manatee County as, as well as we could, and, and, and do you think that maybe you could provide us resources to do better? And wouldn't you know, she hooked us up with Robin Fossey, and so that we could also extend the depth of what we communicate, so that we can really talk about how we want to fund programs that make a difference. So now we're here today, and we're going to ask you the same 
question that we're asking ourselves. Where can you make a significant difference in where you're currently not? I'll ask it another way. What's a big problem that you haven't yet been able to solve? Where's a pain point for your beneficiaries? Where's there a gap or an absence? Would anybody like to share a problem that's come to mind? Does anyone have some thought about that right now? to get to the resources, 
um, not knowing where to go, uh, which a lot of us that are in that field, we think is, you know, well, you just call this person or you just email this person. Well, when a person has lost their job and they don't have a phone at home or they don't have internet, we don't think about that part of it. So one of the things that we see as an increasing problem is transitional housing or affordable housing. I live in the Fort Fair County area. There is no Section 8 left. There is no, you can't even get on a wait list. There is no where to move these families once you leave the shelter. Where do we go now? What, what, what happens? Does the person go back to their abuser? Most likely. So one of the things we, we see as an issue is transitional housing. Um, the parents, the families that want to not go back to that situation, they get their counseling, they get the therapy, and they may go to get these access these things for free. But housing is not free. And so just having that transition of being able to move these families into an apartment or a duplex or a modern home, wherever it may be, find those type of resources that are not on the section of this because that's not available. Um, affordable housing on the grounds in the Sarasota area, there is no affordable housing. Uh, it's a myth. <laughs> so, you know, just things like that, that is that means it's there. It's there and it's, it's, it's growing. So moving people from four inescapable walls to four supportive walls is a really big issue. Anybody else? Okay, one more, or two more. It's, this is your meeting, so we want to hear these things. Educators in the room, that's the first time we've seen someone like them able to 
to talk about these things, and we're not, we're not trying to, they're trying to, to prevent down the road mental health services being needed because peers are to come around to each other. And I just, I suppose I'm not quite sure what the solution is yet, but you know, we're seeing a huge, huge problem where a small organisation trying to do something. Um, mental health is sometimes overlooked, I know it's had a lot of attention recently, um, but updates about how, how we deal with that. Just sometimes just being able to talk and provide those spaces for youth to talk to one another with um, you know, trained individuals who can help them. And we're not trying to replace their counseling service, we're trying to provide that sort of first step opportunity to talk about these things in the manage the way mental health and say. Well, thank you for sharing. We hope to give you some questions that might help you shape what a solution might look like for your organization to truly benefit these kids who need so much help, our future generation. So thank you all for sharing. So let's talk about what we think is a big idea to solve these big problems. You know, does it require innovation and going outside your comfort zone, your current comfort zone? It may. So what do we mean by big idea? For us, big ideas are transformative they will provide solutions that cause a marked change in someone or something. Sounds simple, right? So don't worry, you're going to get this slideshow. You don't have to write these questions down or take pictures. Um, we'll follow up, we'll post this on our website, and we'll also send it to you in a PDF format. So once you, you've obviously defined your big problems, and some of you have gone down the road of thinking about what a solution might look like, we have some questions here to, for you to ponder. You take some time when you get back to, with your teams and your offices to think about what the answers to these questions might be. We do want you to dream big. This is an opportunity to dream big. Imagine living in a world where the problem you've identified is solved. What would that mean for your organization, your mission, and all of your program beneficiaries? How big is the problem, and what part of it can you solve? Oops. Oh, no. So what will really work, and how do you know it will work? How profoundly will your idea affect your beneficiaries? To get the results you're seeking, are your organization's resources and experience ample enough, or will you need to seek funds, program partners, staffing? What do you already have, and what do you need? And how are the beneficiaries impacted if any part of your plan to implement your big idea changes? Those are big questions. Can't wait to hear your answers. Because once you've delineated your big idea, you put all this time in designing the solution that will really pack a punch. How do you convey all of the really important details to funders like Impact 100 SRQ, so that we can truly understand what your solution is and what difference you're going to make. Melissa. Here she is. Now, Melissa, our newest team member of the nonprofit part of Impact 100 SRQ, is going to give you some thoughts on conveyance to share with you now. Thank you. I heard some giggles, and I think that might be because some people already saw my first blood. <laughs> In order to illustrate what a big idea is, we chose to use a very tiny car. Um, and not only is it a tiny car, but it is a jazzy, hot, purple, smart car. Um, does anyone here, by chance, drive a smart car? Sorry to like refer back to the traffic issues you were all in just a moment ago. Uh, I've never driven a smart car and I've never been in one, so if anyone has experience as we go through this, I would love for you to share it. Uh, I want to start just by thanking you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting our organization. 
and thank you for thinking through these big ideas with us. As we go through the next few slides, I encourage you to think about your big idea. Maybe it's a fully formed, jazzy, hot purple smart car. Maybe it's just the framework. Maybe you've just got the wheels. But consider what you've got and work with me to flesh that idea out and help communicate it to our members. So first, we want to encourage everyone thinking through their big idea to be specific. Let's be honest, our, and it's all the way down there in the bottom corner, um, our smart car is not a car for everyone. For example, my husband is 6'4", and I can't imagine him driving a smart car as his everyday vehicle. <laughs> However, it solves for some very specific problems. So when we think about a smart car, we're not typically envisioning it in a rural spot out there like hauling heavy loads or getting corn or whatever else they do in rural environments. We're imagining it in tight, concentrated areas like big cities, and it solves for big problems in those locations. So think about it. It's easy to park. It doesn't require a lot of gas. And it solves for the problem of not being able to stand out in a city because it's hot purple. Um, similarly, we want to encourage you to be specific about your big idea, your program, your participants, and your goals. Remember, our members decide how each of the applications is considered. So help them by creating context. Some may be new to the Sarasota Manatee area. They may not be familiar with our community. Some may be new, many are new to nonprofit work, so they may not be as familiar as you are with the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and many are not familiar with your organization's history. So consider the context in which your big idea exists. Similarly, be sure to explain who, what, when, where, how, and why. Internally, consider within your organization, holding that big idea in your mind. Who are the key players that are going to be involved in your big idea? Who are the advocates for your big idea, both internally and within the community? And what resources or expertise does your organization have that makes you specifically perfect for solving that big idea that you've identified. Externally, consider who will be impacted, how will they be impacted, and consider specifics around where, when, how. Help to illustrate the project. Help to create the context. Some specific questions that you might want to consider answering include, what, are, what is the problem? Who or what are affected by the problem? Help to address gaps in existing services locally. And make it, please make it clear what is new or what will change as a result of your big idea. Next, we want to make it measurable. So going back to our smart car, there are, of course, things that we can measure as it relates to the smart car. Again, I already told you guys I'm not a car expert, but for example, we might think of fuel efficiency, miles per gallon. Some people might consider repair costs when thinking about purchasing a smart car. Please, holding that big idea, explain how you will evaluate the program. Consider what methods you will use, both externally and internally. So internally, consider if you're requesting funding for salaries, as an example, how will you divide the pre-existing work of that person or group of persons compared to their work on the big idea? If it's a capital expense as part of your big idea, 
How will you ensure that you're getting the best price for that capital expense? Are you getting multiple bids? And externally, consider how many people will be impacted. How do you provide the services and track those? Think about all of the tracking and data that you would like to use to measure the impact. More importantly, though, please <coughs> consider the impact of these numbers. We at Impact 100 want to be good stewards of the funds entrusted to us. And what does that mean? Going back to the smart car, where we were thinking about gas mileage earlier, maybe what we're really thinking about is environmental preservation. Maybe what we're really thinking about is making sure people have more money in their pockets to put food on their table because they're spending less money on gas. Similarly, if we're thinking about low repair costs, maybe that fosters industry-wide standards for recycling used car parts. That is the impact that we want you to think about. It is more than just numbers. Think about, and I've heard some of you say these things as you were describing your ideas. Think about security, self-advocacy, emotional, mental, physical freedom. Think about some of the examples up here. Decreased loneliness, increased family cohesion, self-care practices. Please communicate the impact of your big idea. Some questions you may want to consider are, have you defined specific measurements you'll use to demonstrate the ideas? At what intervals will you accept, assess your progress? Do you know how you will define success? And have you detailed how impact funds will be spent? Next is achievable. Um, as I was working on this presentation last night, late last night, I confess, I realized I don't know much about cars. And so I, I did what anyone would do when you don't know much about something. I typed it into Google. And immediately I began reading the results. And it turned out instead of typing smart car history into Google, I accidentally typed in smart cat history. <laughs> Let me tell you, there is a lot on the internet about smart cats. <laughs> but after getting to the right page, I was able to reorient myself to the smart car Wikipedia page. Um, I found out that smart car started in 1998, and then I was distracted by words like drivetrain and ballast weight that I either don't understand or don't care about or maybe both. But here's what I can tell you. They pretty much always looked the same on the exterior, but there have been dramatic improvements over time in the, in the car, right? The type of gas it's able to take, the safety of the car, the efficiency of the car. We want to know the same thing about the key players in your organization, your organization, and the advocates. Describe your capacity to implement your program effectively to achieve the desired impact. Who are your advocates internally, externally, community partners? What resources do you already have? What do you need to build? What do you need to buy? What might you borrow from this incredible community? What capacity does your organization have to pursue this big idea? Is there an energy around it? Do you already have some momentum? Please think about these things as you flesh out your big idea. And please share your history of success. Hopefully you don't have to Google it like I did. Um, some questions to think about here. Does your organization have sufficient resources to successfully implement the idea? And if the project requires additional funds, can you show documentation of additional commitments or additional plans to get the project done? Next is realistic. When I hear realistic, I always think of project management. And so I try to put myself in the position of an engineer thinking through a smart car. Can you imagine in 1998 coming to your team and saying, although everyone wants the bigger and bigger cars, I think the Expedition was one of the most common cars on the road then, 
Um, let's take a really tiny one and let's get some momentum around it. Similar thing here. Think about your big idea. Clearly describe and make the case that your organization can successfully implement the program and sustain the gains once the funding ends. We are looking to help you, our partners, create lasting change. This may be sustaining the project. It may be continuing to support recipients of your services. It may be creating advocates, community partners, people who support you. Things to think about here might include, does the timeline reflect that your idea can be implemented within the two-year grant cycle? Have you considered the sustainability of the idea? Does your organization have a track record of being able to sustain projects? And last but not least, anyone who's followed me this long has probably said, well, I know, Melissa, this is a smart goal, and the T is going to be time constrained, but do I have a delight for you? We put our own spin on it. I'm sure you're surprised. And the Impact 100 SMART goals, the T is transformative. Like Jane said earlier, our mission is to empower women to collectively fund transformational grants to nonprofits in the Sarasota and Manatee areas. We are hoping you have these big ideas and that you can clearly describe and make the case that the program will have a demonstrable impact. We are asking you to please dream big. We want to transform this community with exciting, fresh, powerful ideas. And of course, we appreciate your partnership. We look forward to hearing your ideas, and we hope that we can help you um, define them, describe them, and hopefully fund them. Um, I really appreciate your time. I'm going to turn it back over to Betsy. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for that conveyance. Um, this, it, these are the criteria that IMPACT uses to evaluate your big ideas. And these are the important dates. This, don't worry, you're gonna get this presentation. You can go to our website because some of these dates may be subject to change. We are 404 volunteers. Things happen. But please keep up with us. Oops. Well, Michelle? Yep. Okay. So now, I'd like to introduce you to Robin Fossey. Rhymes with Fossey. <laughs> We've been saying it wrong, sorry. So she's gonna guide you through the rest of today's training, and let me tell you, this woman has worn every hat a nonprofit staffer could wear, so she is so well poised to guide you through really looking at the difference you make in our communities. Robin? Good morning, how is everybody? So, I, I just have a question. How many of you just loved the Lone Up video? Okay, I love it. And the reason I love it is because that really is how innovation starts. That's how problems get solved. That is really how change occurs. I know I've been a lone nut. I'm, I'm, I'm often a nut. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of feeling like a lone nut right about now. And so I'm like, Michelle, hit it. Susie Bowie, 
If you thought it was obnoxious, you can thank Susie Bowie. <laughs> I'll tell you what you do. The Running Man, one time 11 years ago, at a Relay for Life event at 2 a.m. and somehow it becomes your shtick. So, I am Robin Fossey, it does rhyme with Fossey. I'm the CEO for Results First. I am so happy to see so many familiar faces. I'm usually not out of breath because I usually don't do the Running Man before I talk to people. So, I'll get it back. I do just want to thank Impact 100 SRQ. They really go big, they go innovative. There are a lot of funders and investors in our community, and it is so great to see an organization 100% volunteer driven that not just is going to tell you what they want to see in your application, but they're giving you actionable tools and resources to get there. That's where I come in. So I do want to say this. What we're going to talk about today, and this is going to be interactive, so I know a lot of you, even if you have your mask on, don't make me call on you, but we, I want you to be able to use these tools in every aspect of your organization, not just about applying for one grant. Now, I have applied for the Impact 100 grant in the past, and as Betsy mentioned, I have done every role in a nonprofit, but the majority of what I did was fundraising, and then most recently I was a CEO. So, when it comes to really defining results and getting clear on what you accomplish, you can apply this to everything you do. I also want to shift, and I know there's been a lot of thank yous, but I always have to thank the super duper Susie Bowie, because Susie does a lot for all of us. And when I was in the nonprofit world, Susie was a person who was always an ally and a supporter. I know many of you feel the same way. Round of applause for Susie. So, I am also excited to know that here in the room, we have CEOs, executive directors, we have program directors, we have development directors, so it's really great to see teams come together. So now, let's really get things going. So, the result, Results First has three key approaches that really integrate our values who we are as an organization. Results First was started by my partner, the creator, Hal, Hal Williams. I am now the CEO, but I started as a student. I actually started in a class, then I was a client, and now I have the pleasure to be able to work with each and every one of you and other groups on how to really get clear on results. So, our three approaches, and I have to tell you, my transitions aren't working, so there's like no suspense, it's killing me. But, three approaches, putting results first. We look at results as the reason that your organization was created. The IRS allows tax exemption status for nonprofit organizations because you're filling a need in the community. So, your organization exists to produce results. So we believe that you always should put results first. Often results become components of plans, components of organizations. We believe very strongly that it is not a component, it is the reason it exists. Second, activities versus results. We're gonna get into that today. And energy. So, energy, is a very important aspect in not just organizations, but moving projects and programs forward. And so uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted to get started with energy today. Because it is so important that energy, because it comes from people, it is so important to have the energy to move things forward. So this is what everything we're going to talk about is steeped in. Targets for today. What I am hoping is going to happen. Our time together will be considered a success, and you can read these. I want you to have at least two things that are strong takeaways that you can bring back to your teams. Two things that you're going to say, we're going to use this. And you're ready to define the result for your big idea. So let me also ask this. Who 
already has a project in mind, and I'm not gonna ask anybody to say what it is, but hands up and put them up, okay? Great. So, for those of you who have a project in mind, I hope you're gonna have some tools that are gonna help you really strengthen it and really get clear first on what you want to achieve. And if you don't have a project in mind, I'm hoping that this will ignite or spark something or just fully explode innovation within you and your team. So, what I'm gonna do, this question, this is the results first question. You all have a, a, a packet that was handed to you when you came in, at least most people should have it. Thank you, okay. What I'm gonna ask you to do, there is on the back page of something, there is a blank page. I am gonna ask you, we're gonna do this very quickly, to write down how you define success for those you serve. Now, I'm not gonna ask anyone to share, I will say that, but you are gonna have to use this later. Melissa, there's someone up there if you... So two minutes, how do you define success for those you serve? And you should be able to do this within a couple sentences. Do we have Jeopardy music? <laughs> Now, I was dancing, so, you know, I, somebody should sing an intro, though. Just kidding, just kidding. That, that's bad. If you thought the dancing was bad, the singing is worse. And I would say, if you're in teens, that each one of you writes your answer, and it can be different answers, and that's fine, because that's also gonna be very tough. Thirty more seconds. We will come back to this. So, let's go on to get into the difference between activities and results. So, so often when someone is asked, what does your organization do? Or what is your organization's impact? These are the answers we get. And this is where there's supposed to be a transition. These are not results. Okay. So, these are not results. These are activities. So, let's get into how do you then change from talking about the number of people you served to the difference you've made in those people's lives. For me, my introduction to results first was my partner asking me what my organization achieved every year, and I proceeded to tell him how many people we served. And he said, so what? And I was offended. And once I got over being offended, I realized, wow, I am not speaking to what was achieved. So, some questions that can help you get to the heart of achievement. What behavior change occurred? Now, let's really think about this for your missions, okay? If you want people to swim, Behavior has to change. They have to attend classes, they have to be able to swim. If you want a client to do something different, they have to do something different. So how is your program or your organization helping people to do that? What's the difference? And what would happen if your program or your organization did not exist? What would the world look like for the people you serve without what you're doing. This question really brings us to two other things 
for you to consider. And again, this is why you want to do this with your teams. Think of this. It helps you identify duplication of services. And along that same vein, it helps you to identify who your potential collaborators are. I spent the majority of my career fundraising, and so I can tell you that the investors in our community want to see organizations working together. They want to see you complementing each other. They want to see real strength of collaborative impact. Now, how many fundraisers do I have in the room? Hands high? Okay, whole lot of people fundraising here. So. This last question, what are you telling your donors once they're 50,000, or in this case, with Impact 100, that 100,000 is gone? Are the results gone too? This is why applying this not just to a grant application, but applying this to everything you do will really help strengthen your organization overall. This last question, I really challenge you to be able to answer it. And obviously, we really want the answer to be that in some way the result stays, or that the investment sparked something bigger. The investment made the organization stronger. So just something to think of here. Now, I used the word investors, and we like to refer to those who fund and donate as investors. Because think about this. Funding, giving a gift, is a very passive connotation. Because when someone gives you a gift, well, you're not supposed to expect anything in return, right? However, you can bet that investors are expecting something in return. And they should expect something in return. And you know what it should be? It should be results. It should be proof that what they, their investment in your mission, their investment in your ability to take action has improved lives. When I was at Neuro Challenge, we changed our language. We, we started to shift to investors instead of donors investors instead of funders, because it made us more conscientious of what is it that we're actually, we need to be able to tell them what, what it costs. So again, it is shifting from passive giving to active investment. Now, this I would like, so um, whoever has the mic, okay. Very quick answers. Biggest challenge when it comes to results for your organization. There's no wrong answers. No wrong answers. Emily. I'll come up here. Spirit, come up. This is the work we saw. I want to Finding someone who has the time to do it. Love it. Finding someone who has the time to do it. Awesome answer. We're going to touch on it. What are your other? And come on, we're going to, we're all part, all right, Andy? Standardizing your results. Standardizing results. Yes. Very good. Right here. Yes, ma'am. Defining the intangibles. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. It just happens to be part of my presentation. One more. What, what is your big challenge with defining or evaluating? Come on, Jody. Excellent. Not putting additional work on the recipient who already has so much to do. So I'm going to actually take a moment to say this. Getting into a results framework within your organization, it absolutely takes intentionality. It requires a shift. However, once you make that shift, there is a streamlining, there is an efficiency that occurs because you're all speaking the same language and that language is always about what you are achieving for the people that you serve. Thank you for those answers, great answers. So, measuring gains, let's get into some examples. So, educational materials. How many of you either produce educational materials or host educational programs? 
Okay, so this is, this is right up your alley. So often, we report, and I say we because I, was, I did this myself. So often, we report how many people attended the program, how many programs, ooh, ooh, how many counties there's programs, where there's new programs. Okay, so what? Just because you're all sitting here today does not mean you're going to do anything different. It just means you're here. So I can say that I talked to over 50 people this morning, and you know what? So what? What did you do with it? So the people who are attending your programs or receiving your educational materials, what are they doing different? So yes, this does require follow-up. This does require asking people, maybe a month, three months down the line. We know that you received, you requested a resource guide. I'm just curious. Did you do anything as a result of having that information? That's a result, and that's a big difference. Arts organizations and programs. So, so often there is a challenge with, well, how do you define results for a museum or an art exhibit? And again, we go back to the number of people who attended. Well, what if we look at the number of people who, because of an exhibit, or a space, or a place, are now doing something different with their life. What if now they're exercising more, because now there's a park that's safe to walk at by their house, and they couldn't walk before. What if there's an art exhibit? How many of you have ever either been to the Holocaust Museum or seen a Holocaust exhibit? Well, I'll tell you, if that doesn't make you think, what is the difference that occurs after what, what seems to be a passive activity. So those are a couple examples on how you can take activity counting and things that so many of you do. I mean, I would be willing to say that these examples probably impact almost everybody in this room. So now, let's get into the less tangible. So, uh, so often organizations want to, uh, part of their results or what they say their organization produces are things that, well, there's no pre and post tests for. So for those of you who work in organizations where you have pre-evaluations and post-evaluations, I know our friends in foster care, you have various tools to use. However, so many of us don't have that. So how do you measure a less tangible a very, very important outcome. So let's take empowerment. How many of you, either in your mission statement or in any goal that you have at all, have the word empowerment somewhere? Okay, I actually expected a little more hands, but okay, I see a few. So this is something that we often say. We want to empower the people that are taking our programs. We want to empower people. I want you all to be empowered when you leave here to be able to really get clear on what it is, the difference you're making, the amazing difference you're making. So here's a way to look at it. What does empowerment look and sound like? So I'm going to ask, is there anything coming to mind? What does empowerment look and sound like? What would it look and sound like? Yes, ma'am. You're able to do X or Y, and that they're doing it. That's a result. Who else? What does empowerment look and sound like? So whether you measure empowerment or not in your organization, if a person is empowered, okay, so if a person who uh, has been homeless is empowered, what does it look and sound like? Jonathan. Why? Is that what I'm just They know why. They know why. Why they're, why, they're doing the thing. why they're doing the thing. So it can help with prevention. So one of the ways when this was my first real engagement with Results First was we said at Neuro Challenge that we empowered people with Parkinson's and their caregivers. Now we knew they were empowered, but how did we know? So we asked ourselves, what did it look and sound like? We also asked the people we served. What did it, how, how do you know 
that you're now feeling empowered. Do you feel empowered? What we realized, we came up with a set, like a set of criteria for our caregivers. You know how we knew they were empowered? Because they were scheduling respite. Instead of just being burnt out, caregivers have a higher mortality rate. So now, as a result of the programs that we offered, caregivers were scheduling respite. We also knew that the caregiver and the person with the disease, and this applies to, this is not just about Parkinson's, this is for those of you in mental health, this is for those of you dealing with any disease or disorder. We knew that they were having more productive conversations with their physicians. They were engaged in more social activities. That then turns empowerment from something that seems so far up here to, huh, we now can measure it. And what we ended up finding out was that between 65 and 75% of people we served were empowered because of us. I can tell you I feel a lot better about saying that than just saying the number of people that attended a program. Better decision making. So this applies often to youth serving organizations, organizations that deal with addiction. So what does better decision making look and sound like? Barbara. Staying clean. Staying clean. That is a result. If you are serving someone and Project 180 does great work, and six months from now, they're still staying clean, that's a heck of a result. What else does better decision making look like? Emily. Starting a savings account. Ooh, starting a savings account. Not getting the information, but actually opening the account. Now let's see some money in it. One more, what, do, yes. Understanding the difference between needs and wants. You can clearly measure a person's decision making by whether they are pursuing things they need and want. These are great examples. So, safety. So this is one, we did a project with some foster care organizations, and some of them are here, yay, you guys are amazing for the work you do. And when we asked, what does success, the, what's the most important thing? What does it look and sound like? Every single one of them said safety. Safety. We need, we need children to be safe. So, of course they have to be safe. But what happens after they're safe? What happens after a victim of domestic violence is safe? So, this segues to the ceiling or the floor. So I'm going to let you read this quote because I love it. This quote doesn't just apply for what you think you can and can't do. This quote applies for what you think your clients can and can't do. So if you think that your clients can only be safe, guess what? They're only going to be safe. So when it comes to defining success, I, I want to give a couple examples, and I also would like to, for you to just consider a different way of thinking of things. So, defining success when you're working with highly volatile situations, when you have to remove children, when you have a woman who fears for her life and her children's life, a man who is terrified, with his home situation, whatever it is. Make safety. Make the fact that they came to your shelter, they reached out for help, they left the person they were with. Absolutely make that one of your measures. But I truly encourage you to set that at the floor and look to the ceiling. The ceiling being, when you have a child who is aging out of foster care, are they graduating from high school? Are they able to go to college or pursue a trade or secondary forms of education, now we're looking towards the ceiling. For those of you who have programs, like after school programs, and so I know we've got Just for Girls, we've got Boys and Girls Club, amazing programs that I as a child attended. 
So having a safe place to go after school is really important. But what if you have a safe place to go after school and now you're moving towards grade level reading? And now your attendance at school has improved. And now you're more empowered, more connected. So again, having the basic and then looking beyond, if you don't do that, who will? So many of your clients don't know what's possible for them. Neither one of my parents graduated from high school, so the fact that I got a master's degree is kind of like an accident. But it's because somebody told me I could. So, you often are the person or the people telling those that are most vulnerable that they can. Another example I want to give is food security. So I did a project with the Humana Foundation, and they wanted to make investments in New Orleans, and this was a new market for them. They didn't want to just open it up to anybody, because these are huge, these are 500,000 to a million dollar grants. So they wanted to at least have an idea of what organizations were making the greatest impact in the social determinants of health. So food security came up, obviously. So I talked to numerous organizations that did amazing things when it came to feeding people. So let's start at the floor. One of the organizations fed a lot of people. I mean, they were everywhere. They had pantries and churches and schools. They delivered food. Most of the food was non-perishable. Sometimes there was fresh fruits and vegetables. But those families weren't hungry. And being hungry is horrible. So is it important that those families were fed? Absolutely. Absolutely it's important. Should you count that? Of course you should. Then I talked to another organization. Now we're moving away from the floor. And this organization fed its clients with fresh and frozen fruits and vegetables. So now we are solving the hunger situation for their clients, but we're also improving their health. It is no secret that what you eat absolutely impacts your health. So now, now our now impact is bigger. A1C levels are dropping. The BMIs are dropping. I, I need to go get on that pro, uh, project. So then, now we're getting closer to the ceiling. I talked to an organization, and guess what they did? They planted gar gardens in people's backyards or earth boxes, did all of the educational training, for the family or the individual to be able to sustain it. It then ended up producing garden clubs within communities. So now the family has not just fresh food, food fruits and vegetables, healthy foods, they have a sustainable source of eating. I give you this example to truly encourage you, and again, I am not minimizing, I have been in your shoes, my first job, was with the Head Start program in Manatee County. I know how hard it is sometimes just to stop the initial pain or the issue or to get someone to do anything different. But if you're not thinking beyond that initial step, you could be doing your, your clients a great disservice. So I just hope that this will encourage you, again, be innovative. How can you push the bar? How can you be a lone nut? We want to see like lots of low nuts here. So, I want to ask you this. Based on what you wrote down at the beginning, are you measuring results or activities? So I just, I just want you to, in your groups, just, and I'm not going to ask anybody to give any feedback right now. I'm going to in a moment. But are you measuring results or activities? So, how can you shift the statement that you wrote to a result statement? Here are some questions. So, you do have in your packet a list of results questions. So, we start with so what. This is my favorite. 
And my team at Neuro Challenge, I'm obviously not there anymore, so my former team, I keep claiming them. Uh, my former team uh, that worked with me, they still use this. They still want each other. So when you're talking about a new project, when you're defining your big idea, I want you guys to so what each other. Okay, so we want to be able to provide this service for this group of people. So what? And keep so what until you get to the point. And that point is, what's the difference? What is the difference that you're making? And then how much of a difference? So I can guarantee that every single one of you in here has a great story about your organization. I know you do, because that's what we do. We tell great stories. How many of those stories are there? So, if you have a great story to tell, I encourage you to work with your team to go back and say, okay, so we know that Joanna is now reading above grade level because of our program. So we had 100 children in this program last year. How many of them achieved this result? Because when you can tell a funder or a donor, Impact 100, that you are going to be able to make that impact for 70 of the 100 children. And let me just say this, no one's looking for 100%. It's not realistic, and for those of you dealing with homelessness and drug addiction and, and, and foster care issues, look, you're not even going to come close. That's fine. It is about making an improvement. Show your investors that your program, that your organization moves the marble forward, moves the needle in the right direction. This will also help you and your organization to know where not to spend resources. And I think that is probably just as important as knowing where to spend them. How do you know? And this pairs up with what does success look and sound like. So with my clients, I use what does success look and sound like constantly. I say what does success look and sound like to myself several times a day and not just because I'm a low nut, but because when I really am trying to ask myself, what do I want to achieve? I wanted to ask, what do I want to achieve here today with you? And I shared what it was, your actionable approaches, a way for you to truly define what it is you want to accomplish with your big idea. What does success look and sound like? So now, it's your turn. I am going to ask you to take five minutes and work with your groups. If you don't have a group, talk to yourself, it's healthy. Mm -hmm. And I want you to use the questions on your original definition of success to come up with a result statement. And again, you don't have to do this, but I would hope you would because once you start doing this, and then you keep doing it, and you make it just part of what you and your organization does, true transformation occurs. So five minutes.
One more minute. One more minute. success change or what is your definition of success? How did the questions, Barbara, so Betsy, if you want to go up there. I'm not sure if it changed entirely, but we were able to, um, to take our vision, which is to reduce poverty, homelessness, unemployment, and criminal behavior among formerly incarcerated citizens and translate that from a vision into um, just like nuggets of achievement, I guess, results. So Absolutely. Guess. Taking the vision and making it not just quanti qu qualifiable with a great story, but now quantifiable. That is an excellent example. Who else has another example? And it doesn't mean maybe your, your definition didn't change, but did your definition strengthen? Is the way that you're going to pursue it different? I see heads nodding, so I'm hoping people are going to raise their hand. Oh, we over here, Be Betsy's going to get her, her workout today. Running Man is the thing. Is yes, it is. It sure is. Where are we going? Raise your hand, honey, over here. Over here. Here's another one. A lot of you give resource referrals. 
But so what? How many are using the referral? That is, that's an excellent example. So who else? Let's do one more, and I'm really, okay, right here. Yes, ma'am. I guess mine didn't really change. Uh, what my uh, whole goal is, is to uh, fulfill their needs and helping them before it's a lot. We serve like homeless, low-income people, but we also work with uh, re-entry, we have a re-entry program. And so we are aware of what their needs are, okay? Some of them might be like uh, tough skills training. So we're working on, you know, scholarships for that. We go get tough skills training. So we look at the needs and we look at the whole picture of what they need. And then we like housing. So we're there to kind of help them with that. And then we like food. So we're helping them to move forward. We're offering them basic educational classes. Help you in their relationship with your family now that you're back out of jail, you know, those kind of things. So you have to look at the full picture and look for it, and not only the homeless and the low income, look at that full picture and see what these people need. And that's what we're there for, to help them move forward in their lives. Yeah, absolutely, you're there to make a difference. So, offering programs and job training, how many jobs, how many jobs were there obtained? That's now getting to a result. So in this example, because so many of you provide programs and provide education, those are activities. The result becomes when they get the job. The result becomes when they now are gonna get a raise, when they're gonna get a promotion. So if they're already employed and your training is helping them go further. So I encourage everyone, when you're thinking of your programs, it, you have to get really drilled down to activities and results and action words. Really look at those verbs and how we're using those verbs. So now I'm going to segue into, and I encourage you to keep those conversations going, to let the questions guide you to really strengthening, and again, get to the so what, get to the how many made a difference. So, love this quote. This is one of my absolutely favorite. So, how many of you have staff meetings? And maybe with COVID, you haven't had a whole lot of them in person, right? And what happens at a lot of staff meetings? There's brainstorming. I love brainstorming. I love talking about ideas. We are so, we have so many creative people in our community. We have a lot of creative people in this room, really creative problem solvers. But creativity is absolutely nothing without action. So innovation is, what are you gonna do? with that big idea. So I did this, and this just segues into prototyping. So you have an article in your packet. It is a front and back article. I'm gonna just pause for about uh, two minutes. I'm a slow reader, so just please, if you can, read the article on prototypes versus pilots. Does anybody need an article?
Okay, so for the sake of time, because we are, we're, we're, we're getting short, and just so you know, we are gonna save time for questions that will be at the end, and so if you wanna stay for that, we encourage you, please do that. I'll answer any questions, and of course, the impact group will answer questions specifically about the grant application. So I'm gonna kinda move through this a little quicker. So I wanna give you an example, and um, I was asked to give this example because it really, demonstrates a lot of, um, I guess, innovation and in trying something new. How many of you are familiar with the Parkinson's Expo? Okay, a few people. So when I was at Neuro Challenge uh, for Parkinson's, we provided educational support and therapeutic programs for people with Parkinson's and improved their quality of life. And I went to numerous programs uh, educational programs from Michael J. Fox Foundation, which is the largest in the world focusing on Parkinson's, and then other very large national and international organizations. And there were things that were missing. There were pieces that were missing. So there were people talking about great resources like boxing for Parkinson's or dancing for Parkinson's, but there was no boxing and no dancing happening. And so I wanted to fill that void. I also noticed that these organizations are coming into our market here, and so they're getting the financial resources of sponsors. So I knew that there was an opportunity. So what I did is I got crystal clear in 2017 what I wanted to achieve by creating our own signature large-scale event. Number one, I wanted to not just introduce people to resources, I wanted them to be able to then listen to the expert talk about it and go over here and talk to someone about it and then do it. Number two is I wanted to raise the profile of the organization. And number three, I wanted to generate income. So I went through the process, I pitched this to my board of directors, who I will tell you thought that I was absolutely out of my mind. At the time, there was four of us that worked at Neuro Challenge, and I was one of them. I was also the development director. And I said, we're gonna have over a thousand people, and they said, how are you gonna pay for it? And I said, well, it's not gonna just pay for itself, it's gonna make money, so now they really think I'm crazy. And I just said, please, just let me do it. If it doesn't work, then we'll never do it again. Okay, well, what are you starting the planning? And I'm like, uh, once I get a date and a location. Just let me do it, don't ask me questions. And you know what, the board empowered me to do it. I found a date, April 14th, 2018, a location, Robarts Arena, eternally grateful to Rory Martin, and one lead sponsor. I didn't know who was gonna speak, I didn't know what was gonna happen, I knew nothing else. I prototyped this sucker. I announced the event, and our presenting sponsor, who was a huge fan of our organization, said, you know, Robin, I'm noticing in your promotional materials, you're saying there's going to be over 1,000 people there. Well, Michael J. Fox Foundation, they don't get more than 1,000 people at their educational events, even in New York or L.A. And I said, okay. I said, well, if I have to pick them up from their house and bring them, we're going to have over 1,000 people there. So this became a focus, a focal point for me. Because I knew if I could make this the largest in the country, wow, what does that mean? So the fast forward results are this. In its first year, there were over 1,400 people who attended. It was and remains the largest event of its kind in the country. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The event lives on. The event is now at Manatee Convention Center or Bradenton Area Convention Center each year. The profile of the organization, it made Neuro Challenge a national thought leader. It changed us from a local organization into a national organization, or a nationally recognized organization providing resources. And boy, did that come in handy when this little old pandemic came around. And, because I'm a fundraiser always, the event now nets, nets six figures every year. And in fact, even in a viral environment where we had to have the 2021 Expo online, we netted six figures. 
Why do I tell you this? People thought I was crazy. I mean, they really, really did. But they hired me to grow the organization, so they let me at it. How many of you have an expo? Those of you serving mental health organizations, there's so much opportunity. And again, that's a program. It's an educational program that we then turned into a significant moneymaker that changes people's lives. And how do we know that? Because we followed up, interviewed participants, attendees, and, and found out what our results were. 78% of people not only learned of a new treatment option, they then went to their doctor and talked to them about it to see if it was right for them. One man called me after the first expo and said, I'm back playing golf again. I use this example to encourage you to just think big. It can happen, and it can happen pretty fast. So for the sake of time, I'm going to have you read this quote. Another quote I absolutely love. So I am not going to spend much more time on this. Some of you were on the presentation about spark plugs. The point is this. As you're going through the process of either brainstorming about Impact 100 opportunities, but really for everything you do in your organization, who leads the initiative is a critical decision. It is an absolute critical decision. So you do have a spark plug self profile in your packet. I'm not going to get into that right now. I encourage you to take that with you. It's also on the Results First work website. It is um, Manatee Community Foundation does have a video of a workshop that I did specifically about the spark plug and who's a spark plug, but who leads something forward is critical. Spending your time on those with energy instead of spending your time convincing the naysayers. That's really oversimplifying it, but getting to your go first team. Who is going to make this happen? So, let me move forward here and again. Use this, and you can all reach out to me if you have questions, and I'm going to announce something in just a moment. So, another quote that I really, really like. Everybody always ask you, how do you double the, the, the income of an organization? How do you double your results? How did you do that? And you know what I said? I just did it. So all of you just have to start doing it. Just try something new and then see if it works. And if it works, you keep doing it and you do it bigger and you do it better. And if it doesn't work, you just don't do it. But if you sit and plan for six months and then you start doing it and you realize, boy, that just didn't work out well. Guess what? You just lost six months, you lost the energy, you lost the momentum. So I really encourage you to just get started. So I do want to ask this question. Uh, microphone here. Who's Betsy? What are you going to do differently? What, what is something that you're going to take from this that you're going to do differently or, or tweak it or whatever? What are you going to do differently? I'd like a few answers here. I, there has to be answers. You can't leave the room <laughs> until, okay, you should come on, just a second. Apropos of your story about your uh, fundraiser at Robarts, uh, we hold a, a lecture series over here, and the point of the lecture series is to build a bridge of understanding between individuals who have never been incarcerated and individuals who have. But oftentimes, the individuals who attend the event don't really get to spend a lot of time with someone who has been incarcerated. So instead of having a mission moment where one person gets up and speaks, I think this year what we're going to do is have um, a group of our formerly incarcerated citizens um, who have been part of our, our Project 180 um, just at, for 15 minutes, go to a table where no one who is formerly incarcerated is sitting and have them hold a conversation. So 
that everybody can get to know everybody else. It's good for, for each group. That's great. Thank you, Barbara. Who else is going to do something different? Or key takeaways? What are the key takeaways? We have some down here. All right, Betsy is working. Um, it may seem so small, and to me in the beginning it did, but donors are investors. And telling them, thank you for your investment in our scholars, in our community, in our future. So I know at TikTok we're going to really refer to them as investors. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Investors in your stock. <laughs> Collaborate with my coworkers. Um, compliment other organizations. And you know, redefine success. That's excellent. And one of the reasons that the Impact 100 SRQ crew asked you to bring teams with you is when I asked how many fundraisers are in the room, there was a lot of hands. Well, where are the program people? Because at the end of the day, it is our program designers, it is our program deliverers who make the work happen. When we work with a client, we want to talk to the people who are doing the work. Because I will tell you, even in a small organization, the CEO is often a little bit removed. And so it's really important that your team get on board with that. Anyone else? One more. Give me one more. Yes. I'm just going to start looking at the work that we do through a different lens, through an impact and results lens instead of uh, steps that we took lens. And I think it's going to make those intangibles that I asked about a little bit easier to quantify. That, if there was a, a prize, I would say that is definitely a winning answer because that is really what it's about. So I want to announce something very quickly and then we're going to do questions. So. Uh, I just mentioned that so often it is the, the fundraisers that show up, the CEOs that show up, but there are very few opportunities that exist in our community for program directors, managers, deliverers to be able to really learn this stuff, to get this stuff. There's almost nothing that exists. So we are going to be announcing, in fact I'm announcing it right now, it is on our website. We have an opportunity to work with 10 organizations thanks to a very generous donor who wishes to remain anonymous who wants to help organizations build achievement. We're not building capacity because capacity is nothing without results. This is a program that will be offered if you're selected to your organization it does require the participation of two to five people. It will be done over four months. I will tell you the actual in-person work is not time intensive. It's what you do with your teams that's most important. There's more information, and in fact, the actual layout of what we're going to do is online, and that is resultsfirst.org. And here I'll go. This is for nonprofits in Manatee or Sarasota primarily serving Manatee and Sarasota. You do have to have at least two years of financials. You have to have a board approved budget. All of the criteria are listed on the website. You would be, if you are selected, you'll be able to go through this program at no charge because the donor is going to be covering the cost of the organization to participate. Now, really excited. What happens at the end of the program? At the end of the program, the 10 organizations are going to present their projects to our community's investors. Susie has committed to being, did commit to being here, right, Susie? <laughs> oh, she, she says yes. We have someone from the Brancic Foundation who has said that they will be participating, and our goal is to have someone from every foundation and the individual donors that are interested in what you are achieving for those you serve will be there to see your presentation and what you've achieved. Again, I started my journey four years ago just like this, and it truly changed the way that I looked and everything I did in my organization, and quite honestly, in life. So, enough of that. 
You can always reach out to me. This is how you can find me. So now we're going to do questions. So somebody from Impact, come on up. Okay, so any questions, grant or otherwise? Any questions at all? Hi, uh, my name is Ann Fries, and I'm a senior grants manager with Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Venice that covers uh, many counties, including Manatee uh, and Sarasota. And you mentioned at the beginning, and it was one of the things that I wouldn't mind having you elaborate on. I looked at the recipients in the prior years, and it appeared that a lot of them were what I would call CapEx, and then it, you know, intends of either equipment or buildings or whatever. Do you consider this a little bit of a change of focus, or just you know, kind of how things have evolved, or have you always, in your own minds as an organization thought, hey, we really are talking about impact no matter what it is, it just so happens that most of our recipients have been a little bit more CapEx focused. A great, great question. And um, we have not changed our mission from day one. We are what we call a purist. Uh, the first chapter was launched in 2001 in Cincinnati, Ohio, with the same exact mission we have today. Um, what it comes down to is you. We need you to follow the results first program of launching these big ideas and following our SRQ 5Q. And whether it is more of a service oriented, a salary project, um, it can be funded. And I would encourage you, uh, go check out Pensacola's chapter. They're the largest chapter in the world. It's impact100pensacola.org and they have awarded a million dollars every single year for the past 11 years. All of their projects and programs are listed on their website. And Betsy, anything else you want to add to that? I do. Um, the Garden State chapter has awarded all service projects. So look around on our chapter to see what they funded. It's really interesting because it's whatever the momentum is in that specific area. And we're really happy to bust open the concept that we only fund capital projects. We want to fund anything that is transformative. Another question? Well, thank you so much. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you so much for attending. Anything else you'd like to add, Robin? Just thank the Impact 100 ladies again, and let's give them a round of applause. Again, they are all volunteers. This lady here started this whole thing just a few years ago. They are all volunteers, and they really put a lot of time and effort into this. They want some great applications. I am hoping you will apply to be part of the Result Leaders program. It is on our website. Also, more information will be sent out. Um, from Impact 100, you guys did agree to them, right? So you just put people on, on this, get a microphone, get a stage, and then you get everybody to volunteer for everything. But I hope you will try something new, do something different, change the world. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Robin, again, Susie from the Manatee Community Foundation, and thank each and every one of you for attending today. And we look forward to partnering and collaborating with you in the future. And 2022 is going to be an even better year for all of us. Thank you so much for coming.